You ready? We are ready. All right. All right, commissioners, we have a full agenda today. We have about four separate items, three major and then one minor uh, a clarification on the, the news report from a couple of weeks ago. But first we'll have uh, Scott Hadley talk about EMS in a new way we're going to look at doing uh, to be more efficient um, uh, between EMTs and paramedics on how we use those. Uh, so uh, Scott will talk about that. Uh, Lindsay then will follow up and she will do a clarification with Brent Shelton on uh, special assessments based off the news story from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then third, we'll do merchant service fees, talk about that in terms of RFP. Lindsay will kick it off. And then I think uh, Brandy Bailey, who is an expert, 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 Lindsay said. So yeah. she'll, she'll give that briefing. And then finally, uh, Glenda will come up and introduce Juvenile Field Services Evening Reporting Center, and we'll have a discussion about that. So without further ado, uh, Scott, who uh, is suffering through a toothache this morning, so he's going first, uh, so he will speak fast. <laughs> All right, Hopefully clear as well. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Skoll said, uh, he had asked here a few months ago for us to look at uh, the way we're configured and staffed and are there more efficient ways now today in EMS to staff ambulances versus the way we currently do it. What are the historical trends? What does the science say? And I know you were sent a paper, I believe, that I authored here and maybe have had time to read it a little bit and go through it. The PowerPoint, I'm just going to hit the highlights. Obviously, there's a lot of specifics in the paper. But I want to go through the highlights and just kind of outline what we went through to, to look at that. And are there ways that we could staff now today to be more efficient, be more effective without any compromise in patient care whatsoever? So we'll kind of walk through that. Um, first and foremost, um, we're looking at dual paramedic versus single paramedic design. And there's both out there in the EMS world today. And historically, as you'll see, we've been a dual paramedic design configured system since our inception in 1975. And we've seen across the industry over the past five to 10 years of some folks transitioning to a single paramedic EMT or an EMT intermediate or an advanced EMT configuration. So, and we'll go through those terms and show you what those are. Obviously, the paramedic role in our system, in many systems, uh, as, as we are, is an important role. And uh, really, the science there is undisputed what a paramedic brings to our community, brings to our citizens in the way of their medical training. They are often, and most often, the highest trained medical personnel of a scene. Once in a while, obviously, we'll go to a doctor's office and there's a physician there, but chiefly, when we respond to some citizen's home, the paramedic is the highest trained, clinically trained individual on the scene. And that's very, very important for multiple reasons. One, they have the unique skill sets to identify maybe subtle changes or subtle presentations in a patient where they're seeing things that would indicate this patient's more critical than they are presenting with. And sometimes if you're at an EMT level, you don't have the training and skills to identify that. So that's very, very critical that the, the role the paramedic plays in our system here and across the country to deliver that advanced level care when someone needs it. Also, sometimes somebody may initially present stable and seem fine and their condition deteriorates in our presence and then we need to provide that advanced level care. So we need that paramedic to be there in any circumstance on every single call to have those skill sets available for our citizens. So very important that the role that they play in our system and others across the country. Obviously, there's a difference. We, the terms basic life support uh, that you see, someone that performs chest compressions or controls bleeding or splinting and those things at the basic level, a lot of our citizens, that's all they need. They just need a basic level of care. They need vital signs taken, patient assessment, and just that type of care going to the hospital. They don't require an advanced level of care. And we'll go through some numbers here in a little bit. And then there's the advanced life support where they are more serious or critically ill or injured and they require a higher level of care which our paramedics are very capable of delivering. 
Kind of some background. As I mentioned, we've been a dual paramedic configured system since 1975. And if you look historically across when EMS really evolved in the, in the early to mid 70s, the thought was the paramedics the highest level of care. Care having more than one on scene is advantageous for our patients. And a lot of systems around the country at that time were dual configured uh, paramedic systems. Since that time, and science and, and medicines evolved, we know now that not everybody needs that level of care. And not only that, do we really need two paramedics on the scene of every emergency? Is that advantageous? Is it helpful? Is it beneficial? Or are there other ways to configure to still deliver the care that's needed, but yet be more efficient in the delivery of service the way we're staffed? So that's kind of the history for us here. Training requirements. Here in Kansas, it's time they uh, obtain their basic level uh, certification as an EMT and then go on to paramedic school. They've invested about 1,500 hours of training and come out with an associate degree in applied science here in the state of Kansas. So they have a degree once they graduate paramedic school and become certified. An advanced emergency medical technician, which is a new position that's been revamped in the state of Kansas over the last few years, uh, varies widely in their training. It's based on a set of companies and skill sets. There's not really an hour requirement that they must attend in class, such as the paramedic course. And it varies from 140 hours to 600 hours of training across the state. So it's been varying widely. And also we've noticed that uh, at the state level to become certified has been a little bit problematic in that particular area. So. Um, it varies widely, so that is something new that we are looking at as far as implementing here in Sedgwick County. Is this a skill set that would be advantageous? And we'll show you their skill sets a little bit uh, later on. And then there's the EMT, which we've employed for many, many years as well, both part-time and full-time. We currently have four full-time EMTs that work for us and uh, around 15 to 18 EMTs that work for us part-time to backfill for uh, various uh, reasons for leave. But it's about a 200-hour course. It's a semester to go through the course and then to challenge the boards and become certified in the state of Kansas as an EMT. And then the historical trends, as I mentioned earlier, uh, over the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen a lot of folks that were traditionally dual paramedic configured transition to a single paramedic and either an EMT or an advanced EMT level as a, a crew configuration. And so in doing that, what does the science tell us? And what, what does that look like as far as studies that have been done on that particular uh, uh, configuration? So one of the biggest hallmark studies that's been done is the OPAL study, and it's the Ontario Pre-Hospital Advanced Life Support Study that actually took a, two separate groups. It took a group of cardiac arrest victims that had advanced life support available and applied to that subgroup, and then had another group were just basic life support and defibrillation. And at the end of the study, there was no difference in outcome versus the advanced life support and the basic life support group. So that was really the, the initial study that really kicked the thought process off, do we really need two paramedics on every particular call in every scene? There's also been studies done in trauma, and all that's kind of outlined in the paper that you have in front of you in more detail. I won't cover that exactly, but there's also trauma studies where it thought that advanced life support giving large volumes of fluid and other uh, interventions were advantageous, and now that we have more science, it's shown that uh, we don't really need to do some of those things. In fact, it may be detrimental to patients in some particular instances when it comes to endotracheal intubation or putting a breathing tube in a pediatric has been de-emphasized and not recommended in the pre-hospital setting. Also, large volumes of fluid are no longer recommended in, in, in those particular patients that may be hypotensive due to their injuries, have a low blood pressure that we give them large volumes of fluid. So that's been, science dictates that that's really not necessary and may be potentially harmful. And also, skills retention is a big one that may be advantageous when you have a larger group of paramedics to train that takes more resources and time to get those folks trained and then to retain those skills. And they may not 
get the opportunity in the field because there's a lower level of calls needing that particular intervention so not everybody remains proficient at that particular skill which is very very important when it comes to providing that advanced level airway so having a smaller group of paramedics that you can focus on a, a smaller core group you could be able to keep their proficiencies and skills up if you had a smaller cadre of folks uh, to, to focus on versus a larger uh, group of paramedics and as you can see in our system this is two years worth of data over 120,000 calls when we go out on the scene and triage a patient to determine their acuity level and as you notice in our system uh, fifty-three percent of those patients that we encounter only require a basic level of care through our initial contact through the course of their care till they're delivered to the hospital All, about forty-seven percent require an advanced level skill set or a paramedic to intervene and provide treatment and care and monitoring to them so we have a good number uh, that's fairly consistent over uh, the the profession and other areas where you see about a 55 maybe up to 60 percent require BLS versus ALS some of the current challenges we're facing as you're very aware of is rising cost of labor equipment and supplies and you know I've come to you on several different occasions over the past few budget cycles asking for additional money because drug prices have increased dramatically or operating supplies and other medical supplies continue to go up at an alarming rate so those are challenges that we're facing economically that we have to pay attention to also on paramedic school enrollment the large and the vast majority of our labor pool comes from the two feeder colleges here Cali College and Hutchinson Community College which uh, provide us paramedics and even though enrollment may be about the same or down a little bit we're noticing a large number of those students that enroll are already committed to other employers so that makes a smaller group of folks that we have to choose from once they graduate from school and in your paper I outlined one of the most recent classes from Hutchison had 15 students enrolled which is about an average class size but 11 of those were already committed to other employers leaving only four that we may potentially be able to hire so that's another challenge that we're facing as far as our labor pool and the availability of qualified paramedics sustainable revenue streams and again that's a challenge with EMS billing and revenue collection and rev revenue cycle management has always been on the forefront of a fee-for-service model uh, our major insurance providers uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, are capitated meaning you know whatever we charge they're immune to those charges they have a fee schedule that we must adhere to which really doesn't cover the cost of providing that particular service so there, there's another challenge here that we're facing uh, and not only us but others across the country in EMS benefits versus risk uh, obviously the skill sets of paramedics and if you look beginning on page 5 on appendix B of your paper you will notice some stoplight green and red colors and you notice up in each column the skill sets of an EMT a paramedic and an AEMT or an advanced EMT and you notice on the AEMT they can provide in our local system about 85 to 90 percent of what a paramedic can do so really have a fairly expansive scope of practice uh, they would be able to provide advanced level care at that level and uh, that may be advantageous to explore in hiring some AEMTs in the future and we'll get to that in a minute but that gives you a good overview of what the skill sets and what they're allowed to do in our system every system's a little bit different in the state of Kansas uh, our state doesn't have a standard scope of practice like other some other states have a, a standard scope of practice for everyone no matter where you work here it's locally determined by the medical society so the medical society determines the scope of practice for a paramedic for an AEMT and for an EMT even though the state has a defined scope of practice local protocol dictates what they're allowed to do so that is in front of you what the medical society has approved our folks to be able to do at each of those skill levels uh, budget impact on appendix D you can see the budget impact starting on page 8 of hiring an AEMT or EMT versus a paramedic and you will notice that uh, there's about 11,747 
dollar annual difference between hiring an EMT and a paramedic and a little over eight thousand dollars uh, cost savings hiring an AMT versus an paramedic. So there is some economic savings uh, available to us should we elect to hire those folks in lieu of uh, hiring a paramedic. So uh, that, that's another uh, benefit to this. And attrition rates. And if you look on page nine, our historical attrition rates, and if you look at the column uh, separating an employee that's highlighted and bolded, you will notice that we turn over approximately in the last two years 14 to 16 full-time uh, folks in our system. So uh, attrition rates coupled with adding folks, we're looking at getting expanding our labor pool if we're looking at hiring EMTs and AEMTs uh, to fill those roles instead of just focusing on paramedics. So um, we have that going ahead in the next year. Obviously, if we turn over 16 folks, we're adding four folks. So that's about 20 people we're going to need next year. So do they all have to be paramedic? And, and we, we don't think they do. Recommendations. Uh, the recommendation would be to convert during the initial year as 10 paramedic positions through normal attrition to either AMT, EMT uh, configured ambulances. So we want to convert 10 paramedic positions during over the course of a year and monitor that and see how that that works in our system. And uh, currently we have one AEMT that works for us that's going through this process and, and getting trained to perform at that level. We have another full-time EMT that is currently enrolled in Butler County's class in their AEMT class which is a two semester class and it's at the upper and it's a 600 hour course and we think it may be advantageous to hire those folks into those underfill those paramedic positions with those folks and start that process over the next year and see what that gains us as far as some efficiencies in our in our operations obviously we 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 estimate between 82 and 117 thousand dollars in, in annual savings converting those 10 positions during the initial year and then we would go on if everything's working well we would convert another 10 the following year and, and another 10 the following year and you could see there's sort of some substantial uh, savings to be had that are recurring savings year after year as we transition and convert some of those positions over and again i want i just want to reemphasize without sacrificing anything in patient care that's first and foremost we cannot do that and then we reinvest those salary savings that we have into the organization in lieu of continuing to add budget authority we could defray some of those costs with those salary savings the increasing cost of drugs supplies and those types of things the increasing cost of labor and what we've seen we could use that salary savings to kind of offset those costs rather than just keep adding uh, budget authority obviously the keys to success for us is patient care cannot be adversely impacted we've seen through the studies where um, that's not been the case we can't find studies that say two are better than one or three having three paramedics on scene or are, are better than having one paramedic on the scene operational staffing and onboarding of new employees must not be compromised uh, we want to make sure we have a good balance and mix of folks we don't want to tilt go completely the other direction either where we we struggle staffing or getting paramedics where we may have to shut down a resource because we can't find a paramedic to work we have to have a paramedic on every truck so we don't want to tilt the the scales the other direction either we'll make sure that that's done and then obviously the integration must be done through normal attrition and uh, closely monitor for any in untoward impacts we certainly don't want to compromise staffing or care in any way shape or form so we want to do this deliberately methodically over time as other systems have done Wake County North Carolina Austin Travis County Texas works for traditionally dual paramedic systems governmental entities like us have over the past four years or so starting to convert in the same manner that we're recommending here in their particular system so uh, we believe we can do that here safely as well and I'll be happy to stand for any questions that you may have. Questions from the commissioners? Um, well, thanks for the presentation. I'm, I mean, it's <coughs> convincing. I think that's the way we ought to go. But I'm just curious, 
What happened in 13, 14, and 15 when the turnover rate spiked? Good question. Uh, we did a reorg in 2013 that some folks weren't fond of in EMS. So we did a complete reorg structure to the way it looks today with our team concept with team leaders and crew leaders and during that transition some people uh, elected to to leave the organization further than than stay so we saw that when you do a cultural type shift and change that sometimes occurs and this it may occur again this time with this as well because some people may not like this particular configuration so we may ex we may experience that again you mentioned you get uh, your paramedics from two different schools. Typically, that's true. Um, who else hires them? You said the last class, 11 out of 15, were hired by somebody else. Who else hires these people? Like Butler County, um, Newton Fire, EMS, Hark City. There's a variety of ones that need paramedics in their system. So now what are they'll they up there recruiting before we are is why they're getting it. Well, a lot of them are already working there as EMTs, and they said, "Hey, we'll send you to paramedic school, and you get, you you commit to us X amount of time." If we pay for your schooling or help you pay for school, you work for us as a paramedic two or years or three years, whatever it may be. So a lot of that's a, that's what's occurring in, in the majority of those cases. They're already working for that agency in a different capacity. And those same schools teach the AEMT. Yeah, Butler County teaches one. I don't believe Hutch does, but there's a variety of them around the state that do teach the AEMT, and it's. And it's open that, uh, do we want to teach one? Do we want to provide the resources to teach it internally ourselves, which is available? We can't do a paramedic class due to the statutory rules. You have to do it at a, um, a college level. You have to be at an accredited college to because you're getting an associate's degree with that. So, But we certainly could put on our own AEMT class as well um, here at Sedgwick County if we elected to do that. Okay. And scheduling, I could see could be a little bit of a problem because you don't want to get down to the point where we've got whoops we got two EMTs correct instead of uh, one paramedic and one EMT so right you're prepared to handle scheduling along those lines. yeah that's why we want to do this over time by normal attrition and then as we integrate these folks in we monitor that is it having the in, in the, the intended outcome that we would expect is it causing any impacts on scheduling and staffing and if no that's why we want to do it slowly and do it over time any other questions? I have a couple questions. And Commissioner Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm looking at uh, looking at your budget. Uh, I think th this year you have like 192 FTE total. That's with part time in our reserve cadre. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if I'm seeing this correctly, you have roughly 160 um, personnel that would provide the paramedic services. About 160 of those. Yeah, 163 will be 167, I believe, next year with the four additions. Okay. Yes. So. I guess I'd like, to, I'd like to define the end game. If this was very successful, what's the end game look like? Is this going to be like a 80 and 80, 80 paramedics, 80, 80, 80, 80 uh, the advanced EMTs? I don't ever set, see it getting to that level. And the reason why is, again, we still need to bring paramedics into the system so they can advance and be those lead roles to onboard other employees in that manner and that's what wake county and austin travis county are figuring too they they don't ever believe they'll get to a 50 50 split right. but they will get to a point where they still need to bring in paramedics to have them train to have them experience to be able to onboard others and promote in the organization so um, we are recommended at this point go over this to th about a three-year period come up to about 30 and then look where we're at and and then make a determination at that point Okay, um, and, and these two schools that do this training, they're not in, neither one of them are in Central County? They're both outside? The paramedic County. courses are both outside Central County. WSU had a paramedic program at one time. They, they no longer have that. I don't know the reasoning for not continuing that program, but uh, they, they haven't done it in years. Well, I guess I'll just step out there and say, I think that the value of this discussion perhaps would be to allow someone who's wanting to become a paramedic to get essentially some OJT and some internship, if you will, as they move towards paramedic status. Um, allow them to, to ride the ambulance and provide services and make some money while they're continuing their education, hopefully right. become a paramedic. But uh, in terms of the, 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 cost value, the cost savings of this, I mean, even if you talked about 30, so to extrapolate that, that's roughly $300,000 mm -hmm. on a 20, about a 20, 
about a uh, twenty-one million dollar budget, um, and this is fee funded, right? So we're we're charging fees. Most of that is covered with revenues we through billing. About eighty percent, and the rest is tax supported. Okay, I mean, so there may be some value in terms of us trying to you know not provide some tax support, but it would be again, I think it'd be um, ratio metric to the total savings of the entire budget. So. If, if we're 80 percent, and by my calculations, probably closer to 85 percent uh, is fee funded. I'm sorry, is is fee uh, fee provided? If the end game is to lower fees or, or, or keep the fees from going up, that, that's certainly a good discussion. Um, but uh, in terms of our, uh, you know, in terms of property tax funds, we're talking 15 percent of 300 thousand dollars. It's just not a, and that's and again, that's if you added 30 of these positions uh, to to do this. So, it's just not a huge part of our budget out of out of our 440 million dollar budget and, and all that. I just don't see this as a is a tremendous driver. The value of this, in my opinion, is to get people to take those positions and get them in the seats as soon as possible. Get them some some chances to to, to hone their skills and, and provide some value to the citizens and make money in the process. So to me, there's a uh, I'd like to, to you know I guess open this up uh, because attrition obviously is an issue. You're talking about potentially. Um, it looks like some challenges of finding qualified people to fill these positions. So I, I don't know if we have a surplus of paramedics. I, I think that's the wrong way to, to view this. What we have right now is is a, is a challenge of getting um, the right people uh, into the positions because there's a, apparently somewhat of a shortfall. And if we could simply allow those folks to, to become part of our team, they could come in and continue their path to the paramedic status, but um, provide services a little earlier. And in terms of the financial benefit of this, it's just it's almost not really the driving discussion here to me. I mean, it's a, it's a small part of this, but it's not that big of a part. Um, I guess that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah. And, and it advise, uh, to me, it, it provides maybe a, a career path for someone who has aspiration, who hires as an EMT. I can't afford the time to go to paramedic school because it is a large 1,500-hour investment, but I could go to AMT school. And, and get a promotion and work in that capacity for a while and then make a determination later, can I go to paramedic school and, and us helping him with helping those folks with that so we do get to retain quality folks in our system. So I, I do have one, one more question. Since Sedgwick County and, and Fire District are, are separate organizations, could someone who's a, a Sedgwick County Fire District number one employee, an EMT, could they fill a position as an EMT for Sedgwick County EMS? I would have to look at the, the labor rules, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anybody else, Lindsay or somebody, as far as working. Karen is looking in, and I've already asked that question. Huh. And we may not be under FSLA, LA. a separate organization. Well, let me throw it out there. A lot of our firefighters do have, you know, part-time jobs they do outside because their, their mm -hmm. schedule does allow for that. So yes. I can see potentially maybe some part-time EMT interest in this from the firefighters, um, unless there's a, a law that would prevent that. I guess I'd like to open that door up and let them let let the let everyone who's interested in this that meets our qualifications. I I, I don't want it to <clears throat> exclude someone because unless there's something a legal an actual legal barrier, I'd like to open that door. For right. the, for and we and we do that with the which. For Wichita Fire Department. We have part-time folks from Wichita Fire that do work for us, or Derby, because they don't don't have that question to answer. So they do that. Okay, so I, I have a question. You, you have all these ambulances. Why wouldn't we make one position a paramedic and one the EMT position? I mean, what is it you're saying? I, I'm saying we'd do a combination of that. We would we would make some a single paramedic in either an EMT or an AEMT configuration, not two paramedics on the truck. That's what we're talking Why about. Not all of them? Because you run into if you run into all of them that way, eventually you need to replace paramedics. You need to onboard them. We don't want to get into a configuration staffing challenge if we, for instance, had five paramedics all of a sudden quit and try to. How do we fill seats on ambulances if we are exactly 50 50? Well, well I, okay, well, I guess what I'm saying is you have an ambulance and one of them is, is, is requires a paramedic, the other one requires an EMT. Mm -hmm. 
Well, part of the process is those EMTs are already trained up. You may have an EMT who has advanced all the way up to a paramedic, mm -hmm. but they can't fill that position until there's another position. And then you, I think there's a way to do address your issue, I guess, and still say that this, this is what we have. I mean, just because it's an EMT doesn't mean you can't have, I mean, the minimum requirement is an EMT. Doesn't mean you can't have an AMT in there or a paramedic fill in that position until they're ready to move up into a position that right. authorizes it. I mean, that's what I yeah. uh, And that's why we, yeah. You know, I mean, we don't wait until you need a paramedic to get someone trained. You said that's an ongoing, continuous basis. Right. Well, I think the yeah. I, think, I think the beauty of it, you know, when I asked uh, Rusty and Scott just to take a look at what's in the order of possibility, uh, well, there was no pre-selected position on, you know, you will go to an EMT paramedic. I just asked him to look at it, but in the end, he he came back with, hey, you know, this is a benefit uh, based off industry standard, based off of succession planning, based off of. Uh, efficiency you would gain I mean all the indicators are it's a good move uh, it, and we'll do it gradually uh, deliberately and we'll see where it takes us and uh, certainly over the next uh, couple of years uh, we'll, we'll fine-tune it to where we're, we're supporting uh, the best uh, use of both paramedics and EMT so Good. I don't see any other questions. I don't see a problem with uh, trying this out, and I do believe three hundred thousand dollars is a fairly significant amount of money. Yeah, it can certainly help us over. Like, say, coming back, you know, need fifty thousand here or twenty-five thousand here. That could certainly offset some of those things that we're seeing in our budget, and we'll continue to see. All right, Scott. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. All right. Second topic, uh, Lindsay. Sacrificial lamb, in other words. Exactly. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, as the article reported, in 2015, we refinanced some uh, 2006 special assessments. So, out of that $11 million bond issue in 2015, there was about $375,000 worth of specials that was refinanced. In the refinancing package, the projected debt service savings were about $24,000 over the life of the remaining five years of those special assessments. As we have looked at what's been happening with the couple of years of tax levies, special assessment levies and collections have been occurring, current year we're underwater by about $1,400 in terms of what we've collected versus what our debt service payment would be. So I guess the bottom line is there really isn't any savings at this point to be respread or to, re to reduce special assessment payments on the one issue that we've got. Okay. So that's, we've got more detail if you want it, but that's sort of the bottom line. There's we nothing to pass. Towards the end, we will flip and then be able to return some back, or have we done that projection? We could do that. Um, what we'll find is that Probably the trend would indicate that there would be some delinquencies that would get paid. So we may be in a position when we go into the 2020 tax roll to look and say, we've saved 15,000. We've saved some number that we could then respread on that final year. But at this point, respreading each year, um, it costs us more than what we're, what we're talking about. But shouldn't, but shouldn't the amount that we assess why are we underwater? Because of delinquencies or what? We just haven't fully collected right. Our, uh, the special assessment levy, uh -huh. the amount that's being levied, is pretty, pretty much on par with what we're going to need to make the debt service payments. But you always calculate some delinquency every year. Okay. If you need $100 in tax, you levy 105 to make that but up. Shouldn't we recalculate the amount 
that it would take to pay back the, the new bond and base it on that regardless of whether or not we're behind? We can do that if we I mean, did. That's what I thought that we would have been doing. If we do that, right now we'd be about $8,000 behind. And so since this is general obligation debt, we'd be making that up with other revenues from the county. But eventually we'll get that. I mean, it's because if people haven't paid. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should, the assessment should be based upon the actual cost. I mean, I mean that's true about any bond that we do. I mean, otherwise we haven't readjusted based upon the, the refinancing. That would be my position. Right, we have not re-spread the specials. So that's what, unlike, I would contrast this with the city of Wichita, because the city of Wichita, for the most part, has had their special assessments already completed. We still have life on ours. Of our 15 years, we still have five years left. And so, in order to make sure we don't get further behind that other people are not subsidizing the special assessment, it makes more sense to wait and see how people pay. Some people prepay, some people pay multiple years at a time. Like Brent's talking about, some people don't pay, they're delinquent. Um, and so, to me, it makes more sense to wait until the final, until we know where we stand, and then give everyone across the board whatever their fair amount of No, I, I uh, disagree. Reduction. It should be an ongoing, it should be based upon the re, uh, refinancing. Because all those issues you talk about are. Uh, are, are, are a factor regardless and what if somebody sells and moves and you know they I mean that would be a mess it should be and I, I think we need to read personally you're gonna have to convince you're gonna have to come in and, and show me some stuff and convince me I think we need to reassess that and just like I say all those risks you're talking about I get it but that that's a risk associated anytime we do a special financing but if we refinance it and, and that amount goes down, I think the new, uh, we should, that's when it should happen. Well, what we can do is maybe put together some numbers and come off the holes with commissioners and then maybe see if, um, I think we have talked about maybe there's a policy change or a special assessment policy to include a provision about how commissioners would like us to approach that. At this point, no yeah. one's been damaged because the special assessment is still going. Um, but we can make it so that going forward we have a clear direction and we have clear what to give the clerk about how we would like to re-spread that. Yeah, that's just my opinion. Yeah, you want to talk to I hate to say that I agree with Commissioner Unruh. <laughs> or uh, Commissioner uh, Vance, uh, rather. Uh, uh, I, I agree that uh, uh, we're going to have those problems no matter what. If, even if we didn't refinance these, these special assessments, you're going to have people that didn't pay, uh, that fall behind. Mm -hmm. It, it's an ongoing problem no matter what we do. Uh, the problem I see if we wait till the end, you could have sold that house two or three times or that property. And so uh, how do we go back and, and say, hey, we refinanced it back here. You should have gotten a savings. This person should have gotten a piece of savings. This person should have gotten a piece of savings. And now we're going to give it all to the guy at the end? That's not right either. Uh, so uh, if we don't uh, recalculate it, every year, and I hate to say that that's probably going to take a lot of work, but if you don't calculate it every year and put those savings directly to the people that have it at the time that they're making that payment, uh, then somebody along the line is, is going to uh, pay more and somebody is going to get a benefit that they shouldn't have gotten. Maybe what we can do is, is talk with our partners in the clerk's office and maybe come up with some ideas about how we can approach that and then have that when we come off okay. the hall. The, the other point I want to make is uh, I was a little concerned when I read the newspaper because uh, what we heard when all the commissioners asked you this question was we don't do what Wichita did. But it was totally confusing when I read the newspaper. I said, I don't know what we're doing now. Uh, so that's why we're having this discussion today. So, uh, it, so, it, so it, bottom line, plain English, is we're not doing what the city of Wichita did in keeping the revenue from the special assessment. But so we haven't figured out what we're doing yet. It doesn't sound like. Well, in five years is when this question would come up. If you if if there is a policy change that we want to implement now, we can do that based off a of consensus of the commissioners in what you're talking about. We would just create a new policy to do that yearly uh, assessment. Well I don't and, think we can wait five years. 
because there, it's really going to be a convoluted mess at the end of five years trying to figure out, oh, uh, Richard owned a house uh, uh, back five years ago, and we got to go back and figure out, well, he gets $3.27, and, and uh, Commissioner Unruh owned a house, the same house two years ago, and he gets $2.50. Uh, that's that's going to be a mess if you got to do it that way. Mr. Chairman. What? what? Go ahead. All right. So two things. We need to be talking with the Builders Association about this before we make any policy decisions. Would you agree? I mean, reason. What's the Builders Association have to do with it? They're the people that set this whole thing up, you know, 30 years ago. The specials you're uh -huh, talking about. The specials. But it's the, not going to impact the, the builders. It, it absolutely does impact them because of the way that when you develop uh, a section, um, it does, it does impact it. I mean, th this was all their idea. But the issue is maybe refinancing causes a whole lot of problems. You can't pay off your special assessments early and get any type of a rebate. You it's can. not like your car or your home or anything else. <laughs> so you're locking people into a set amount of money. So the only benefit to a local government for refinancing is to make money for themselves because these people are locked in to that amount. So why do we even refinance it then would be the question well, we because there would be there would be more staff time and dollars put into what you're talking about figuring out what rebate is given to who then the people would potentially save I mean you're talking a few bucks a year potentially that if people know they're going to be paying a certain amount of money and they can't pay it off early um, or if they do pay it off early there's no benefit um, th this whole thing just seems like it's an avoidable uh, mess. Commissioner Adler. I'm 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 agreeing with Commissioner O'Donnell. I I think that I don't know how much the total per capita savings this amounts to, but I think it's it's probably huge more cost of staff time than the savings they get. If we have an area that's asked for special assessments, the, the taxes and, and the payoff on that special should be kept within that area. And if, if we do a lot of extra expense and try to find out who owned it when and who owned it what, we're going to be left then with some expenses, I think. That means that I'm living over here and I'm ended up picking up some of the expenses for their, for their uh, improvement district or whatever. And district. people do not have an expectation that they will get any type of a rebate back. Yeah. They get into that thinking they're going to pay $15,000, $20,000, whatever it is. Um, there's not a mechanism to pay it back. The main thing is we shouldn't make money off the refinancing of right. these specials. And if we reconcile it at the end, I think that's a reasonable approach. Yeah, no. At this point, we're not. We are not. <coughs> Right, and we're, okay. we're planning to reconcile at the end. Good. And if if there's a few bucks variance over a five or ten year period, I mean that's just the way it happens. I just don't see that's an issue. We would necessarily have to do anything every year. Would uh, would we like if, if right now we if we issue a bond, we calculate how much it's going to be, right? And do we charge the same thing every year, or we we have a schedule? We have a schedule. And so, for example, the Redmond Estate is occurring right now. Uh -huh. We had a deadline of last Friday for people to essentially pay their special assessment now uh -huh. of an equivalent amount, and then they would not have to pay interest. So those folks will not be included in that special assessment. We can bring that to you in a couple of months. So, yes, there is a schedule, and they know what they're going to demand out for the prepay at the beginning and not be included in that. But then after that, every year, it's a set amount? Yes. That's, okay, well, all I'm saying is, when you refinance, you just redo that that one time, and then you have you have your schedule for the remaining five years or ten years, right? You could. It's the same mechanisms, I guess. It's just with a different loan amount. It is, but I think if the point is to try and return that savings to people earlier in the process, then that's where the staff work is going to be pretty intensive. Why is that? Because you just don't charge them in their specials to begin with, and they never pay. Well, I think, so for example, in this case, we'd already had 10 years of uh, special assessments assessed. It's just the final five years, that 15-year term, where that refinancing applied. Right. And so I guess if we're wanting to make that equitable and spread that across the prior 10 years, which is maybe what I'm hearing might be a, a 
that no, you, you spread it across the next five years. Oh, I see. You, you say now, now, now's the loan amount. Now, for whoever owns it, then boom, boom, boom. Okay, yeah. Okay. The, I, I think that would be a kind of policy because that would be a little different than, than the normal approach. What we're saying is if you waited towards the end of those five years, you'd have to figure out all those. You know, the savings begins when the refinancing begins. And then anyone who owns that after that enjoys that benefit. But if you wait till the five years, then you go back through those previous five years to figure out who did it. But if you just set it at the beginning and then boom, you're done. Yeah, but the total cost of the project then is totally reduced. And if you want to be totally equitable, you've got to go back over the whole group and give them the savings too. Because the total cost of projects been reduced. Right. We could do it your way, but I mean, if we're going to be legalistic, we legalistically equitable, then we've got to spread it back over the whole time. I'm not so sure you do. Well, that's so that you're making an administrative decision. No. I'm just applying basic common sense to the situation. <laughs> okay. I mean, basic if, common sense is if, if you have a mortgage payment for ten years and you pay a certain amount <laughs> and then you refinance it and that amount goes down, you just pay that lower amount for those. But you can pay off your mortgage and save a lot of money in interest. You cannot do that with specials. Right. I, I, I got it, but I'm using that as that. We got we. We can talk about different ways, but based on the conversations that we had, I mean, what I thought we were doing was, based upon the conversation we had before, is not what we are doing. That That's the issue. We to help. Yeah, I, do we know which properties these bonds are connected with? We got a parcel. Yes, we do. Okay. I would di I would disagree with one of the previous comments in that I don't think this is about who happens to own the house at the moment. I think it has to do that property has a tax that, that's connected to that property. Whoever owns the house is going to pay that off. If they sell that property sometime during the process of, of, buying, of paying off that bond, they transfer whatever debt is left. That's the thing they negotiate out, and the, t the total value of that home includes whether the, pay the specials are paid off or not paid off. So. I'm not concerned about the personalities behind this. I'm con I, I would like to say that that this, these bonds are connected to specific parcels, regardless of the owner. And uh, I agree with what I think Commissioner Ranza said. This is a snapshot. You can't you can't apply uh, savings retroactively. You can't go backwards and say we you know someone who paid off something a long time ago is going to get a one dollar rebate. That's just ridiculous. But I think you say as of right now, we save this much of money, and you apply it to. Whoever, whoever owns that debt right now, they're the ones that have the savings. So if you if you suddenly find the savings because you refinance whatever debt was left, the people who hold that debt should get the rebate or should say it should be re reflected in what is owed for the remainder of their special assessment taxes. So to me, it should be applied at the point of refunding. Whenever that happens, divide that out and, and make the adjustment on their, in their tax rolls. For the very small number of lots this is going to deal with. It's not a huge number. It's not like we have Wichita. We have a very small number of parcels that we, we do this for. So it's not enormously difficult for us to do this. And we had about it's about 100 parcels, so a little over easy. 100 in this deal. I think this is going to bear a little bit more discussion. Yeah. Bottom line, I think we want to return it to someone. We're not going to keep mm -hmm. it. We're not going to make a profit off of it. Right. We, now we just got to figure out how to do that most efficiently without uh, costing us money from staff time and, and effort. So it's not it's not resolved at this point. <laughs> That's probably our current policy, <laughs> <laughs> or we do we do it at the end. Uh, but it could cost us more in staff time. Lindsay's saying, if, yeah, if we do it savings now. savings would be. If you look at it per year, or we have savings estimated like thirty five hundred dollars. There's a good chance that we can put up a and finance. Yeah, we can And that and that's why I think we need to have a discussion with the builders association. The different developers as they're getting in, talking about it up front, what happens if there's savings? 
do we give it back to the developer, the individual houses, does the county just keep it? People are getting into contracts knowing they're going to be spending $15,000 in specials willingly. So, so I think there maybe needs just to be a resolution up front of what's going to happen with excess money. Well, I think we're going to have to come up with some options and walk the hall somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. All right. You live enough blood? I'm just <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, and Brandy will talk about the service fee RFP that you, it's on the agenda for tomorrow if you to vote on. So, you should have the handout at your seat. Uh, what Brandy will do is Good morning. So first I want to just kind of give you a little bit of a definition as to what emergent service is. Um, emergent service, it's really a broad category of financial services. Um, most specifically, it's used as um, merchant, merchant, merchant processing services, which enables a business to take a payment card, a credit debit card, um, via encrypted and be secure. Um, so why, why did we go out for RFP and look at providing um, a bit change? Um, first of all, it's time to review. Best practices tell us that we should um, go out for RFP every five years to evaluate, see if there's new, um, new things going on out there in the merchant services world that we could take advantage of. Um, we've been with the current vendor since 2012. Um, costs, we continue to see the costs increasing on um, what we pay to our merchant service provider. And over the last, few, um, last year or so, we've had some customer service issues with our current provider. The RFP process, um, we sent a merchant service RFP out to 61 vendors. We had 13 vendors respond to us. We had a review committee that scored the responses based on criteria that were set forward in the RFP. That review committee con um, consisted of myself, Steve Stonehouse from the Department of Corrections, Debbie Rogers, Nancy Roush from Treasurer's Office, and Mike Elpers, ERP, and Greg Gann from IT. Um, sorry, I didn't <laughs> move it. Um, Gila, um, doing business as Municipal Service Bureau, MSB, so going forward I'll just say MSB, and Value Payment Systems were shortlisted and brought in for interviews and demonstrations. MSB was given the highest ranking throughout the entire process and was chosen for the award. MSB recommendation was taken to bid board and approved by bid board on August 9th. Um, and then, it, like Lindsay said, it'll be on tomorrow's agenda for your approval. So I want to talk a little bit about the current model that we're using for um, merchant service. It's called interchange plus fee model. And what that means is, so Bank of America is our current provider. Um, they tr they're charged a fee by the card brands, so they're charged by Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express. Um, it's generally a percent of the overall transaction. And then that fee is then passed on to Sedgwick County. And then on top of that fee, Sedgwick County pays four cents for every credit card, signature debit card transaction, and 20 cents for every PIN debit transaction. This is a highly fluid number, the interchange rate is. It can change, um, it changes all the time. There's no way to get a, an exact dollar amount as to what your fee is going to be. Um, it's dependent on the mixture of type of cards that we're using. So whether you're using a debit card versus a credit card, whether you're using a credit card versus a, and a rewards credit card, a credit card, just a regular credit card versus a business credit card, um, just depending on what type of card you're using, depends on how that interchange fee is, what it's going to cost. Um, like I said, it, it varies from day to day, let alone month to month. Um, there's, no, <laughs> there's no good way to determine what that fee is ever going to be. Um, 
with the model that we currently have, Sedgwick County now assesses a convenience fee to our property taxpayers only. Um, this is to help us recoup some costs that are being charged to, by Bank of America. With the model we have, um, the, there was a lot of discussion last time when this was brought to you about being a two-swipe model, so you'll have to swipe the credit card twice to collect this convenience fee. Um, that was because legally we're not allowed to charge pro um, increased property taxes, so if we charge that convenience fee because Sedgwick County is assessing that fee, that really essentially um, the swipe of the card will show an, an increase in the property tax. So they'll see one line with an increased cost instead of being able to split it out on two lines. The current machines that we have um, didn't allow us to show you a line where, with the property tax and then a line with the convenience fee. So that's why we would have to essentially do the two swipe model. Um, Treasurer's office who does assess the convenience fee, um, the way that they work around that is they process the payment online versus instead of doing it at the at the terminal. It's a limitation of the of equipment that won't separate those out? Essentially yes. Well how do we fix that limitation? Um, our current provider doesn't offer the machine that allows us to swipe it once and break out it, break it out by line. But this one will. This one will. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. B B machines, B O A machines didn't have the capability to break out that convenience fee, and because the convenience fee isn't being assessed by Bank of America, it's being assessed by Sedgwick County. We had to have it where it was broke out twice. Is that by state law? that we have to break it out? Well. Or is that just our own preference? I'll get you answer exactly on that. Um, I, my understanding is yes, it is law that, because you're essentially, if you have it on the line as one, one swipe, one charge, um, a customer could say, well, you've increased my property tax payment by $2.50, and legally we can't do that. Okay, but we didn't increase the property tax. Correct, but it's on the I line. Wanna make, I, I, right. I want to make sure that that's a legal requirement and not just personal preference here locally that we're putting on ourselves. Okay. So the proposed model we would like to go with is a convenience fee model. Um, don't get that, please don't get that confused with the convenience fee we're charging customers. It's just, it's the same, same word. Um, used in different ways. Um, so what this does is it assesses a fixed fee to customers directly with one swipe of the card. It applies to all transactions, not just to property tax transactions. The fee is then kept by the merchant bank, MSB, and then there is no fee or no fee will ever be paid by or billed to Sedgwick County. Um, the Proposed rates would be 2.19% fee charged to customers using a Visa, a MasterCard, a Discover, American Express, or a signature debit card. Um, a 1.79% fee charged to customers using a PIN debit card, and a five cent fee for customers using an electronic check. And, and currently we're, char we're charged 24 cents for PIN debit? Is we're charged correct? 20 cents for PIN debit then, plus the, the interchange. The, that four cents and then four cents for signature debit or credit card mm -hmm. so this this is substantially higher than this 1.79 percent for debit card it is yes and we'll get to that in in a couple okay. of slides so a little bit about a little history on the merchant services in 2017 Sedgwick County paid Bank of America three hundred forty two thousand dollars in fees um, also in 2017 we collected two hundred eighty eight thousand from property taxpayers in, in by means of convenience fee. This this amount was helped to offset some of that three hundred and forty two thousand dollars, but in total Sedgwick County paid still roughly fifty over about fifty four thousand dollars in fees. On June fourteenth, BOCC approved change in the convenience fee from two percent to four percent. Um, and that was just strictly for credit cards um, and it ended up being with signature debit cards as well. A 4% convenience fee is assessed only to customers who are paying their property taxes using a credit card or a debit card without entering that PIN. Um, also back on June 14th, um, when we decided to start using a PIN, we had Bank of America switch on for that PIN option, so that was never an option for the customer prior to June, the June 14th meeting. A customer using a PIN debit card um, was not assessed any fees at all.
So here's a little bit of a breakdown of how 2017 actuals came out. Um, for credit cards, we had 45,000 transactions um, using an actual credit card or a signature debit card. The average spend on that, on that particular card was $339. So currently, at the 4% rate, that customer would pay $13.58 a transaction. If we would go to this proposed 2.19% based on the average transaction from 2017, the customer would be paying $7.44. Pin debit cards, we had 3,211 transactions, and that number is a little low because um, June 14th was when we turned on the option for the customer to enter a pin. Um, the average spend for those types of cards was $168.98. Currently, if we stayed with the model that we have, that, that, that customer would not be assessed a fee at all. But posed, we want to charge the 1.79%, so that customer would pay $3.02, essentially. For an electronic check, we had 21,534 transactions. The average spend on those is $2,183.63. Currently, there is no fee for a customer to use an electronic check. Our proposed model would go to um, charging those customers five cents. So what type of changes would the customers see? Um, a pin debit card customer will now pay at 1.79% for their transaction. An e-check customer will pay five cents per transaction. All divisions will now have the fees rather than just the treasurer's office property taxpayers paying a fee. And credit card users will pay less of a fee. Um, they'll pay 2.19% versus the 4% that they're currently paying. So I want to go over a little bit of benefits that um, we would see going with this new model with MSB, the convenience fee. Again, Sedgwick County would not pay any fees at all. We would never see a bill, um, zero. Um, customers using credit cards will go from paying the 4% to the 2.19%. All, equip all equipment necessary to implement this change would be provided to us for free. Um, it would be, we have 33 across the count, um, cu county. There's a payment terminal plus a touchpad, so it's a, the device looks something similar to what you see at Dillon's instead of just the little machine we have right now. Um, but you'll have a payment device where it has a nice screen on there, so like what you're seeing at Dillon's. Um, every division will see two backup machines in their possession. Um, the machines will are, chart, are given to us at no cost. They'll be programmed for that particular department and ready to go. So if their machine happens to go down, they can go to their back room, get the machine, plug it in, and they're back up and running. They don't have to wait, call in, and wait for it um, overnight processing. So that way it gets activated. It's ready to go. Um, online banking services will be established for decisions currently using online banking. Right now, Lake Afton, um, Sedgwick County Park, um, County Court's Office and Treasurer's Office use that online banking site. Um, it's provided to us in seven languages, which will be in a drop down. It, it, it does include Spanish and Vietnamese. There'll be an option for customers to call in and pay their property tax payments via the IVR, the Interactive Voice Recognition Program. Um, that's also available in seven languages. The proposed vendor will work to establish online bill pay for any interested division. So um, I know finance, fire, forensic science center, there's a lot of departments, MABCD, that are interested in being able to have their customers go out online and pay their bills right there online instead of having to come into the office. This will be set up once the vendor works with each of the divisions to get their requirements and their specifications and they have all that. They told us they can have the site up and running fully functioning within 30 days. Um, there will be an option for a mobile payment via an, the app on your phone, and that will be provided to us for free. There will be an option for e-payment table kiosk. So if a customer comes into, say, the treasurer's office and wants to um, pay their tax payments, but they don't want to wait in line because it's the last day to pay your tax payments, there will be a, uh, it's, it almost looks like an iPad sitting on their counter. They can go to that, make their payments right there through the kiosk, and that's provided to us for free. All training will be done in person. Um, the MSB has told us they don't believe in training over the phone or uh, um, via um, conferences, um, internet conferences. So they will come in person and train every person that they need to train, and that's free of charge to us. 
Um, the pre proposed vendor is a payment facilitator, a pay fact, which means that they own their own merchant network. There's no third party person involved in this process. Right now we have a third party um, person. We have Bank of America. Our third party service provider is um, First Data. They process the payments, send the funds over to Bank of America. Bank of America sends it to us. This um, eliminates that third party. Um, they are government pay fact, and they're only one of seven licensed in the country. Um, the proposed vendor has a redundant regional system. They have four sites located at least 900 miles apart, um, being in Texas, Virginia, San Francisco, California, um, and in London. Um, what this means is if one payment processing um, or one center goes down, the other center can um, have our stuff up and running back in 90 seconds. So that way there's no delay in, um, in our business. And they have 13 data centers across the United States. Um, they're PCI compliant, level one, which is the highest compliancy there can be. Um, well, as soon as our machines are plugged in, we're automatically will become or PCI compliant. Um, a data breach, if Sedgwick County was to ever be breached, um, MSB would 100% cover the cost of the breach. Sedgwick County would not be liable for any penny of it. Um, they've told us, knock on wood, they've never had a data breach, but they would cover all costs associated with a breach. Um, all customer services. Our, our, our customer service representatives are located in the United States, and every quarter their executive staff um, have to go out and do background checks, and this is what makes them a government pay fact processor. Um, in conclusion, this is fair for everyone across the board. You're not um, having your t property taxpayers subsidized by paying the 4% to cover the fees that say maybe the fire department has incurred or the finance department has incurred. We're spreading it evenly across the board to everybody who's using the credit card or a debit card. Um, and there's always the option there for the customer to come in and write a check or pay with cash and there's no fee associated with that. With that, I'll stand for any questions. Questions from the commissioners? Um, we're talking about going to kiosks for the tags. Uh, and I would imagine that's either going to require some kind of a reader to read a check or to a credit card, one or the other. Uh, so and with the tag office, that's more through the state of Kansas. Um, so ours are only associated with just the treasurer's office activity. So none of this is going to apply to buying tags. No. Okay. Question. Question, Commissioner. <clears throat> now, so, so going back to the interchange, uh, interchange plus fee model. That's the current model. Um, so if someone uses a debit card today, we don't charge them anything. It currently costs the county twenty-four cents. Is that correct? No. It charges. It costs the county the interchange. Um, rate, which we don't know what that is. That varies depending on the type of the card. They might have a, a rewards a debit card or something. If Plus, then tw then twenty cents on top of that. There's a, such a thing as a rewards debit card. You get a cash back on using a debit card, not a Visa card. And you run it as um, a Visa. I get it. Right. But. Yeah. Um. I'm not 100 percent if there is that type of card, but I'm just trying to um, say that it's not. I think there's different types of debit cards that are out there based on the type of the bank that you have. Well, this is a very important point for me because if someone uses a, a debit card, it's the same as writing a check. It's immediately withdrawn from their account. Um, fact check, I think it saves us taxpayer money by not having to process a check. So it actually is, better, is more efficient for us to accept a debit card. And they're not trying to finance their, their payments. And so that's why I believe that there <clears throat> should not be, you know, on their end of it, if they make a choice to use a credit card to pay their taxes, they're going to pay potentially interest on, on that charge, and there's going to be cash back. Uh, I know there's cash back or airline mm -hmm. miles or whatever that uh, is a benefit for someone to use those types of cards, which is why I think those fees are higher. But if someone uses a debit card, it's the same as writing a check. Right, and and, and depending on the bank that issues that debit card, it can when when it's swiped, it travels. They call it the debit card network, and there's several different. Um, routes it could go. It could go through the um, STAR network. It could go through the info network. There's, I think there's seven different types of network it could flow depending on the, the, brand, the type of the debit card it is. Um, so then that interchange fee, depending on what, which network it chooses to flow through, that's how the interchange fee is determined as well. So, and there's seven different options there where credit cards we have, there's, I think there's 
20 or so different options as to the route that a credit card can travel. So the 2.19% they're charging for interchange, that's the number, right? No, 2.19% percent, percent of, uh, of the amount is being The amount that is being charged, yes. How much of that 2.19% is, is the interchange fee or how much of that is, is a, like a surcharge? There's, there's, there's no surcharge, um, and they haven't given us a piece of the interchange. They don't, they didn't, in the proposal, there's no interchange right there. They're saying, okay, we're going to charge you a flat fee of 2.19%. We know some cards might be, essentially, if you went to the interchange fee, we know some cards are going to be less than that 2.19%, but we know there's going to be some cards that might have a 3 or 4% fee but we're going to give you a, we're going to charge the flat fee of 2.19%. Okay, so there's a I think the most relevant point here then is I need to I need to know whether or not there's an interchange fee being charged on debit cards. I don't think there is. There Maybe is. I'm wrong. That's that's the that's dependent on the network it's flowing on through. a pin debit transaction. Yes. Yes. There is. And I have got a list um in it uh, updates um Bank of America sends me um, an updated list it's like every three months as to what the fees are based on the, the debit card and which in which network it flows through. Okay. I, think I have a couple of other questions here. Let me, let me find it real quick. I'm sorry. So there's some of these options you guys are you're talking. You know some of the new new um, things being proposed here, some of these uh, kiosks and language uh, options, things like that. Are those things we asked for, or are those just something they they offer automatically as part of their They're suite? offered automatically part of their suite. Okay, so this was, not a, this was not something that was considered in terms of the awarding of this? Correct. Okay. Correct. All right, well, I'll just tell you, I've got, I have some concerns about shifting uh, costs from people who are getting cash back People who are essentially using an electronic check, we call, we call it a pin debit. Sure. So I have, I have concerns about that, and I, you know, I think it's great that we're going from four percent down to two point one nine percent for credit cards. That's, that's good. Um, can you please clarify one more time, what was our total uh, shortfall in, in merchant service fees this last year? This last year it was fifty three. Fifty-three thousand six twenty in twenty seventeen. Currently, we're at a shortfall of seventy-nine thousand nine hundred twenty-five. But our biggest part of the tax season is will happen starting in November. So we'll we'll see that reduce a little bit. So that should go down. Yes. Okay. And do we know? And, and you told me how much money uh, Bank of America made on on these fees. Do we? You said that number was it was buried it's in somewhere. Three hundred and approximately three hundred and thirty. Three hundred thirty-four thousand. Do we have an estimate what the new vendor will make uh, on our contract? No. We don't know that. Okay. Do we have some history on because of the fifty-three thousand dollars shortfall for last year? Do we have some? I think we have, I've seen this before. Do we have some history going back? I could. Yeah. I like um, to refresh on, on on those numbers going backwards. Yeah. Um. It was around a million. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think we made this change. It was a significant reduction in our yeah. costs, and it was uh, obviously the right thing to do at the time. But go ahead, Commissioner Ranza. So this e-check, five cents for each one. I did a calculation, and I think it's you know based on. Twenty-one thousand five hundred. That's a thousand dollars a year that they give it. Is there going to be uh, five cents? I mean, they're going to see five cents added to added to their transaction. And um, most of the vendors that did respond in the RFP had a fee, um, some type of a fee for an e-check. Five cents was actually the lowest fee that was in the proposals. Well, my only thought is. Questions we're going to get as to why you tacked on five cents to my e check. I don't know. Yeah. That's just, yeah. Um, to go back to your qu question, Commissioner Howe, um, in 2017, we had a shortfall of $53,620. In 2016, we were short $52,676. In 2015, 
um, we were short 10,930, and in 2014, we were short 42,920. Yeah, but if you go back further than that, before we started doing this, before it was, we started charging, it, it, it was a million dollars. It was a million dollars. Yeah. We can pull those stats up and yeah. email some of the Commissioner Rowe, so, uh, Unruh. I'm Unruh. You're right. This is Ransom. <laughs> uh, in case, yeah. Most I people see, know I can that. see how you get us confused. I know. <laughs> They're so like politically. <laughs> well, we, we look alike, don't we? <laughs> well, they could just old white guys, right? Right. <laughs> uh, we, we are, our, our uh, deficit is going to reduce because we're upcharging people more than it costs us, right? A little bit, yes. Okay, so I'm I'm glad we're getting away from that. These charges that we are, or that are going to be assessed, um, are determined by our vendor. We negotiate to get the. We're not in that at all anymore. Correct. We so Sedgwick County will not assess a convenience fee at all. So we would come back with um, a adjustment to the resolution that's out there um, to get rid of that four percent. Um, and Sedgwick County would not assess the fee at all. Um, it would be MSB that's assessing the 2.19% credit, 1.79 debit. So that's not Sedgwick County assessing and, it. And all those fees, uh, I mean, we evaluated them, and these were the most reasonable. Correct. Or, or the lowest cost. Um, there was two vendors that were essentially a little bit lower, um, but in the... Um, um, in the criteria that we set forth in the RFP, they failed in some of those those particular categories. They just happened to have a little bit lower of a fee. Um, one of them was the current vendor that we have, Bank of America, but they didn't um, offer us a convenience fee model, so they kept essentially the same fees that we would have. But when we look at all the other criteria, it must be overall was okay. the highest reward, the highest um, ranked vendor. Okay. Well, I just want to feel assured that. Um in our investigation, we got the best deal for people who want to pay with this method of payment. Yeah. And, and it sounds like we have. And most people understand if you use a card or an e-check or any of those, you have a fee associated with it. And if we got the best deal possible uh, and we stayed out of it from our general budget, then I'm, I'm Correct. Okay with that. Mr. Chair. Commissioner O'Donnell. So I asked the, the treasurer, and they do charge 2.25% for debit and credit at the TAG office. So um, both of these, whether it's the 1.79 or the 2.19, is is obviously lower um, than they would pay there. But I agree with the electronic check. I mean, at a nickel, would there be a mechanism <clears throat> for us to absorb that cost on the e-check? It's something we could discuss with the vendor. Okay. Let's see. Thank you. Sure Clarification on that. That is a... Uh, Kansas Department of Revenue office. We, we run transactions for them on their machines. We don't set the rates. Correct. The state of Kansas does. They need to review theirs, in my opinion, and uh, make some changes on, on their side of it. But uh, to the extent we have a policy that impacts everything else in the city of county, especially the treasurer's office, but the tag office is not our office. We, 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 we staff it, but it's their policies yep. and their fees and their, their machines that, that charge those fees. So I understand that, but this is, has no bearing on the tag office in any way. No. If we change this, we will not change what the tag office no. does. No, correct. But currently, we're charging 4%, and the tag office is charging 2.25. I understand. 2.25% on debit cards as well. I just, to me, it's frustrating. I can go almost any place and use my debit card, and, and I understand that um, there's a small fee that usually the, ven the, the, the business will just absorb that because it's a very small fee. There have been, there's been lots more discussion about card, you know, um, about cashback cards. And usually those those benefits are buried in the prices of things we pay for because they know there's a certain number of people who will pay using a credit card for the cash back uh, benefits. Right. And so that that's buried into the cost of everything that they do. Um, we can't do that here. People are paying for exactly the, the amount of government that they use. And so we can't increase our our costs to you know to cover this. And so that's why we have a, a legal a legislative right to to charge a fee to cover the cost of. Of government, but when someone makes a choice to use a particular card, I want to transfer that cost to somebody else who made a different choice. Right. And I, we, we, and we don't need to, and we haven't been doing that. So, I have, I have some concerns about about that part of this. And again, so if that interchange fee is, is is applied to debit cards, that's news to me. But yes, um, at the end of the day, uh, this is important that we lower the cost as much as possible 
So our, tax, our, our, our citizens are not, not paying, you know, not necessarily high fees. It's important to them. This is not, not, this is no bearing on, our, bearing on our budget anyway, other than if, if there's a shortfall. It, right. If there's right. a shortfall. And, there, if there's a shortfall. I'm not sure yes. you've said this yet or not, but is there a projected shortfall or, or surplus if we were to go to this new model? Well, if we go to this new model, then we're not out anything because Sedgwick County won't pay anything. So right now we're at it. So at 2017, we were at $53,000 deficit. So if we were on the convenience fee model, we wouldn't have had that $53 de deficit. You please, please tell me once again, what's the convenience fee? How do you define that? What's the, what's the, the convenience fee model? Well, what's the aspect? What's the part of the about? Yeah, what's the what's the issue of the convenience fee that makes this more beneficial to Cedric County? Because that convenience fee is a set rate that is charged by the vendor. So Sedgwick County is not charging that fee. So the, so when a customer comes in and pays their property tax payments and say they're paying um, they're paying their their payment. So they're, the, on their receipt, they're going to see say $100 for their property tax, $2 and um, $2.19 for their um, fee. Um, MSB is going to keep that $2.19 and then send the $100 back to Sedgwick County. So therefore, because MSB is keeping this $2.19, they are never going to send Sedgwick County a bill say, you know, saying, well, you will still owe us this much because they used a business card, so it's a higher higher interchange rate. So back to my point, if someone wants to pay online, they do an ACH uh, e-check, okay? Or if they want to come in and pay with a debit card, those are both good choices. And both those choices mm -hmm. save us money in terms of processing. It doesn't require someone to, to to process a check that might bounce or track that back down. Um, we're not being charged, again, maybe I'm wrong, and I probably am, but it seems like we've been we've been charged very little to run a pin debit. It's a very small fee to us, and so that's why we just said, let's just waive it because it's not worth the administrative costs to try to collect a tiny a tiny little bit of money. And so that's why we've kind of done that in the past. The, the, the biggest burden of this whole thing is for someone who makes a choice to pay the credit card, presumably because they don't have the money or they want the cash back. There's reasons why they choose that method, but it costs government more. Therefore, we pass on that cost to the people making that choice. It's their it's their choice. I'm, I'm fine with that. Right. But I hate to see somebody else have a have a fee. And they made a great choice. That they're not they're not trying to finance their their payments. They're trying to minimize the cost that they pay with the most efficient efficient methods. And now we're right. trying to give them a fee because somebody else is making a choice to finance their taxes. Or, but. But the um, customer using the debit card, we are charged a fee for that by the vendor. R currently, currently, there's the, we are charged the interchange fee plus twenty cents for every pin debit that's used. Okay. Now, if it's a, if they're using the signature debit, meaning they're not entering that pin, they're signing for that, then that's essentially run as a as a credit card. Right. Yeah. Now, I understand the difference. If they if they type in a pin, it's it's a debit card. It's automatically withdrawn immediately. If they sign yes. their name, it's the same as a credit card. Correct. And uh, they should be charged the same fees as if it was a credit card. I get that. Correct. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Ranzo. Okay, so I get it that, that we aren't charging a fee, but when they do these transactions, there will be another line that says somebody is charging a fee, right? Correct. So we still need to be prepared to, to address <coughs> that issue and, and make it clear that that fee, though, is we are retain. We need to tell we're retaining zero of that. Correct. We're not getting any of that. That's the cost. So. Somehow we need to be prepared to, ex to explain right. that the, it's not our fee now, it's our vendor's fee, and we get zero out of that. Right. Yeah, it's, it's your card. The people you have a card, it's their fee, not our fee. Or right. Your, yeah, or your our bank that wrote the, the yeah, clearinghouse check. Yeah. They're charging, not us. Okay. It's basically the fee, we're getting charged to process it, and we're getting zero out of it. That's, that's the main thing, is that we're not... You know, I mean, some people, were, you know, in the past, if we charged a certain percentage, you know, we, we could have made some money on some transactions yes. and lost money on others, but we're not losing or making on any transaction. Correct. It's all going to. We're going to charge this strictly the property tax and the fee, and that's what we're going to keep. Anything else that's charged is charged by MSB. MSB keeps that as their right. cost to offset the fees that are associated with processing that card. That's what we're going to have to try. One final question, if we approve this tomorrow, is it going to be in effect uh, come the, the property tax time this fall? 
we we've talked with our the MSB vendor and um, depending on how long it takes for um, both legal departments to get the contract up and going but we've made it clear to the vendor that we want this up and ready to go in the at least the treasurer's office by November 1st so that way when property taxes are mailed out it will be in effect November 1st uh, all right. I don't see anything else I appreciate it what you got next all right final uh, we're gonna talk about uh, have Glenda come up and introduce I guess Janice you're gonna Janice Jenkins for is going to talk about juvenile field services and the evening reporting center good morning commissioner <coughs> manager management team um, so we were um, thinking about letting you guys know a little bit about the evening reporting center and how well it's doing Denise is going to talk a little <coughs> bit about that just a reminder that when Senate Bill 367 came into play, they, um, we, they reduced a lot of the out-of-home placements for YRC2. And what that did for the state is it gave them a lot of money, which they tur turned around and gave back to the county in, in, uh, in the form of a grant. And that we picked two grants because we also did a regional collaboration. So it was a reinvestment and a regional. And we were tasked with coming up with gap services in our community to help kids stay at home and receive services. And so those came in the form of two grants. One was 648,000 and the other was a regional collaboration at 250,000. And so Janice is the administrator for the juvenile field services program that uh, manages those two grants and our new evening reporting um, center and she is going to talk to you a little bit about how it's doing which started May 1st of this year good morning thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on the juvenile justice reforms and how the Senate bill 367 impacted juvenile field services in our programming just a brief oops let's see here just a brief history of our juvenile field services and the reforms uh, prior to 1997, juvenile field services did not exist. Um, the court services, community corrections, and SRS had the task of providing supervision for juvenile offenders. 1997 to 2000, the juvenile justice reform was developed, and juvenile justice authority is what we used to be called, JJA. Every, some people might be familiar with that term. And the focus at that point was prevention, intervention, community-based supervision. In July of 2013, KDOC um, merged juvenile systems and adult, and that's when we became juvenile field, KDOC juvenile services. So juvenile and adult are under the same KDOC. And July 2017, the Senate bill um, that I'm sure all of you have heard about came into effect, and that created an amendment to the Kansas juvenile justice systems. And a few of the things that changed were that there was an established case link limit to remain in the jurisdiction of the court. Prior to this, kids could come on probation for a misdemeanor and they could stay with us for a year, two years, three years, six years for a misdemeanor. Now there are limits on how long we could supervise the youth in our programs. Uh, one, another change was is that there was adopted um, a statewide graduated responses grid and that means that Sedgwick County along with Wyandotte County, Johnson County, whatever county it is in the state, across the state, we were held to the same standards in order for a technical violation. For a kid to be violated, we all had to follow the same steps in order to keep things consistently across the state. Another change was that um, Katie, the Kansas Department of Corrections closed, like Linda mentioned, a lot of the out-of-home placements for you. Um, the current um, contract is, is that they are allowed to have up to 50 beds statewide. Just to give you a little perspective, in 2015, there were probably about 85 placements that youth could go. In 2017, it dropped a little bit to like 40. There was 40 placements throughout the state of Kansas for juvenile offenders to go. And as of today, there's one. So with the reforms, that one, is really- One bed? What, one placement, and that's in Pratt, Kansas. And the capacity for that commissioner is 11. So we went to 11 beds statewide over the last 10 years. 
we went from over 85 to, to 11 beds. So that's pretty dr drastic. Also during this time frame, in I would say March of 2017, the state closed Larnard Juvenile Correctional Facility, and there is now only one facility, and that's in Topeka, that juvenile offenders that are incarcerated like an adult prison. It's for juveniles, there's only one in the whole state. And their capacity, so the state capacity for youth incarcerated, their beds is like 235. So a lot of different changes over the years. Just a snapshot of some over the last 20 years of second quarter data that we could share with you is that just when the program was beginning to start, you could see it was, we had 392 youth that we were serving in um, case management. 2008, 10 years later, we had 559. 20 years later, we only have 110 kids that we're serving that were in out-of-home placements. That's it, case management-wise. Can you guys see the big numbers, that how things have really, really dropped? Um, and juvenile intensive supervision, probation, that pretty much stayed consistent. We had 126 kids 20 years ago, and we've got 128 20 years later. And those ISP kids that I'm going to mention in the next slide, those are the kids that are staying in the community, they live with their parents and they're on probation, and they come to our office to see us. Here are some of our success rates over the last 20 years. For case management, um, 1998, our success rate was 30%. Well, back in 20 years ago, we weren't doing all the programming that we're doing right now. So the kids just came in and we just watched them be naughty and we really weren't doing anything with them and 10 years later our success rate is 59 percent and we started doing a little bit more programming with them to this last quarter uh, it was 100 percent success rate for those youth we also see in conditional release kids that 10 years ago we had a 76 percent rate and um, currently it's 64 percent but it's really really exciting and I'm very proud of the work that we've done because between 2008 and 2018 the kids are really serious offenders that are going to the correctional facility now. The 2008, um, you, you, there was really no requirement to get into the correctional facility, so we had it made. We could, we're, the kids that were coming out were easy, but the kids that are going in there now and coming out are not as easy. They're high risk youth. So the 64% is really, really um, a great success rate for um, the staff to be able to accomplish. And we've got 88% success rate for the kids that are on intensive supervision probation. I just kind of explained a little bit about the, the core programs that we have, the kids that are on ISP is what we call it, our kids that are on probation and they come into the office. Um, they don't have offenses just yet, potentially to go to um, out of home placement or in the correctional facility. The juvenile case management kids are those kids that ha are in the state's custody and uh, that we work with. Conditional release kids are those kids that have gone to a correctional facility and they reintegrate back into the community for us to work with them. You all might remember the JRBG, the Judge Rydell's Boys and Girls Alternative Program. We kicked that off November of 2015, and that service has started pro the programming that we started with ART, T4C, and since that program inception, mm -hmm. we have successfully graduated 57 youth from that JRBG program. And the Evening Reporting Center is our newest venture. We started that. May of this year, and um, we have kids that come to our facility. And the next few slides, I will show you how we did a little bit of remodeling in our current location in order to be able to accommodate the youth that we have. Um, this is a list of all of the programming that are offered at Juvenile Field Services. None of this is contracted out. This is all the ISOs, the therapists, everyone that works at Juvenile Field Services is able to provide all the services. Thinking for a Change, ART, um, one of our newest curriculums is the Parent Project, and we had 17 staff from Juvenile Field Services get trained in the curriculum, and that curriculum allows the ISOs and the staff to be able to work with the parents to give them appropriate parenting skills, communication skills, the skills that they need in order to work with their youth to make them successful. And here is the, like, the few slides that we have that are actually, this is one of the murals in the Evening Reporting Center. And since May, I'm really excited that we've had 200 referrals. We've had 121 youth that have been served 
and we have a, the average daily population is like 29. And the population of youth, how they get to us is that we've got seven vehicles and we go all over to all the schools and to the city to pick the kids up, bring them back to our location and they get dinner, programming, and then we take them back home. So it's a venture to say the least to get that all accomplished and everyone's doing an awesome job. The kids love coming. So these next slides are just a few more slides of the kids in action in their classrooms. This is thinking for a change, some youth in there. Kids attending ART, job skills, and the pictures of the people that you see are the facilitators, and we try to get the, the pictures of the back of the youth. This is one of the other training rooms that we have, classrooms. Seeking Strength is a curriculum that we offer, and that addresses kids that have faced trauma. So that is a curriculum that we offer as well. Independent Living Skills, we have Accountability Panel. MST is a, um, a program, a curriculum that we offer that involves not just the kid, it's the parents, it's the siblings, it's everyone um, working as a family. And MST, we have three counselors, and they have served 17 youth. And this is really, really intense because they literally go to the home, they meet them where they are. If they have a crisis in the middle of the evening, the kid won't come home or won't do the dishes, they can call their MST therapist. Um, so we really have been really working with this, not just the kid, but the parent and the family as well. We've got some great connections in the community, and this is, we've been really, really grateful that O.J. Watson Park, the Central County Health Department, Wichita Art Museum, His Way Books, that these people in the community, organizations in the community have allowed our kids, and if you guys, have, you know our kids can be a challenge, so they've allowed our kids to come in and participate and do community service work projects. Um, they've also um, offered the kids lunch when they go, and they've invited us back. So I think that we've done a pretty good job if they're allowed to, uh, willing to let us to come back in and just work out with them and clean up the community. Um, any tasks that they have for us, we're willing to do that. And we do that on Saturdays. And the community service work allows the youth to be able to meet part of their commitment sometimes for court orders is that they have community service work. So we don't make that a barrier. We make sure that we're allowing them to be able to get that done. We also have some other agency partners that come into the facility um, what the barriers is that the kids don't have transportation to get to where they need to go. So we tried to take that part of it out and provide services in our building and our location. So they have, some of them have drug and alcohol issues. Well, quite a few of them do. So we have drug and alcohol counselors on hand. And so they do the groups at our facility so they don't have to leave our building and try to get their appointments. So everything's offered at our location in the evening reporting center. We also had the Wichita area sexual assault um, <coughs> counselors asked if they could come and meet with the young lady that has um, that they were trying to support since they couldn't catch her at home. And we I absolutely um, allowed them to come in and anyone else that we have that they need that um, particular um, service, they would be willing to come into our office and offer that as well. Just another location for us to do our community service work, His Way Books. The kids actually got gift um, cards to be able to go back and purchase books from His Way Books. Them working in the community. This is the day room. They receive incentives for participating. The program, the youth particularly come um, maybe 90 days, the program is 90 days, and they come after school, and they come on the weekends. So this is a lot of work and commitment that the kids um, have to put into the program, and they're showing up. And so they get, um, this is just the shot of the van, of them going shopping to get um, independent living items if the youth are living on their own. We have quite a few youth that pay their own bills, that live at home, and the startup, we've allowed them to choose, they wanted to choose household items, they wanted to choose dishes, they wanted to choose those kind of things. And so those were the incentives that they used as um, when they were able to complete programming. The, the last few shots are the youth receiving their incentives. At graduation, we make it a big deal as of their accomplishment. This is the last slide. Um, so far, I put the JRBG and ERC together. We've had 15 youth from the Evening Reporting Center graduate. That's since May 1st. 
and um, five of those youths were from JRBG. We're really excited about you guys' commitment and your support. And at this point, that's the end of my presentation. If there's any questions, I'd be willing to take those. Questions from the commissioners? Is, is the evening reporting, did you say that it's all grant funded? It is. So, so it's not on our budget this morning? <coughs> no, sir. Okay. Well, my second comment is you seem like an evangelist. You're really into this. Um, I guess that's what makes it successful. I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> And evidently, much of your staff has that same attitude. They're very enthusiastic, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ranzo. The presentation, could you just send that to us electronically? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I'd like to have a copy of that as well. But I also want to say thank you, Janice. You're uh, uh, wonderful in your role for the county. Appreciate what you thank do. You. Can you answer a question? How many How many of our Sedgwick County youth are, are because of, because of uh, bed space issues, are, are sent out of county at this point? Do we know? I do. There's only two. Two, two. Two youth. That's all we have youth. is two youth, right? And that's been steady for the last four or five months. We have not had eight, more than two kids, and they're in France. Okay. That's the only YRC two that's left in the state. All right. How many beds do they have? Do you know? Eleven. They have eleven. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank and you. they're not full. Okay. Well, thank you for being here today. Uh, you're over at Harry Street Mall, the old Harry Street Mall, correct? Yes. Thank you. And uh, we've had an opportunity to go over and check it out. Uh, I think Commissioner Unruh and I were over there. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you for And um, uh, saw it personally. Uh, we appreciate what you do over there. Uh, we got to meet some of the kids. We got to meet uh, a number of the staff. So thank you very much for what you're doing for our youth. Thank you. Appreciate it. What do you have next? That, that's it. That's it. I'm, well, I'm done. Commissioners, what do you all have? Anything? Any legislative agenda some other time? Well, I was going to hit a couple things. So. Okay. Anything else? I've got a couple things to touch on. Uh, first of all, don't forget today is 9 11, and don't forget the Americans that uh, perished on this day 17 years ago at, uh, at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and out in the field in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, next thing, uh, I talked to Commissioner Yost yesterday, I believe it was, about the, the KAC legislative platform. And uh, out of 105 counties, uh, six counties submitted something. We were one of the six counties that submitted something. And now they want us to, if we care uh, about getting some of those on their agenda, and now we have to go up and brief it. So I guess my question is, uh, is there anything on there that our commissioners want to travel up uh, and, and brief? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I did speak with uh, Linda Kazire. I think she is going to go up on the item that she requested. Okay. Us. And her item that she requested was minimum of ten dollars for property tax bills. Right. It doesn't look like we've got any commissioners who want to go up and brief. So. Uh, yeah, we can, we can advance our yeah. agenda through our. Uh, I think that our our lobbyist was very successful, and we can probably keep working that direction. Okay. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, folks at the zoo for a very successful Zubilee. All those that uh, were there, I think, enjoyed their evening. It got a little misty, but uh, there were a ton of people there, and, and there was plenty of food and drink. Um, on the 18th of October, anyone interested, uh, there is a Legislative Transportation Vision Task Force. Is, uh, that's the one that was created to the, figure out what kind of uh, transportation uh, issues that we've got across the state. They're going around the state to hear uh, the different folks speak. So it starts at something like 8 o'clock in the morning at Hughes Metroplex, uh, and then they have, where they learn, uh, the, the task force learns, they've got a working lunch, and after lunch so I, uh, we'll get to brief on the things that are important to us. Uh, I foresee that there will probably be a cooperative discussion with uh, Wichita and the North Junction. Uh, I think that that's probably where the cooperative uh, discussions will stop because I think we'll probably put something forth. Uh, uh, possibly we're going to have to have a discussion, but on the northwest uh, bypass, uh, I think we'll probably have something that Sedgwick County may want to submit on that. Uh, Sedgwick County may want to submit something on trying to see if uh, 54 Highway going west 
that we can eliminate things like stoplights at 119th, 135th, 151st, 167th, 181st, because um, if you ever travel west, why all you do is stop. Is that in your district? That happens to be in my district, too. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we'll be doing some more work on that. Uh, yesterday afternoon, my Commissioner Unruh and I got to go over and uh, to, to WSU Tech, and we met the uh, uh, Under Secretary of Education for the U.S. Education uh, for Career and Tech Ed, and we got to chat with uh, him a little bit in a roundtable discussion uh, about Career and Tech Ed. And as you know, uh, right now, especially what precipitated a lot of our interest was the thousand new jobs out at uh, Spirit, uh, but. Uh, we're uh, very interested in economic development, but without employees' uh, uh, workforce, uh, we can't uh, have very good economic development. So we've been working that as a number of uh, uh, different working groups in the past. So it was kind of nice having someone uh, at the national level that's an undersecretary uh, come in and, and listen to the, the concerns and, and what we can do for career and tech ed. Um, it brings uh, one other issue uh, going along with uh, with career and tech ed. Uh, uh, they asked me to be the government representative uh, for the state of Kansas uh, on a career and tech ed advisory council, and I have a meeting on that uh, in Emporia next uh, uh, Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, uh, and we have a, uh, a staff meeting next uh, Tuesday that I think we're going to talk about the. Our fire legislative platform and uh, Weba and uh, and Sked, and I would be very interested in setting in on those. I don't know if those can be put off or what we can do about it, but I won't be here when uh, Tuesday morning because I'll be in Emporia uh, to talk about current tech ed for the state of Kansas. So yeah, we'll we, push those off. We need to discuss that. Let's push it to Monday. Yeah, we can possibly uh, we we'll have to take a look at calendars. We may be able to do it Monday. Okay, I um, uh, got a briefing yesterday uh, on the VA, and the VA is still having a number of problems, uh, and they're not paying us as they should, and it's due to a number of issues. Uh, we talked about uh, getting a letter drafted up, uh, and uh, right now the question is, should uh, I sign the letter out? And we're going to sign, send a letter to each of our two senators and each of our four representatives and say that there's a problem with the VA. Uh, I need to know what the commissioners would like. Uh, we can either send that letter out with uh, our manager's signature or we can send it out uh, uh, with the chairman's signature. So uh, I don't know what, send it out with chairman, okay. So if you guys can draft that chairman's signature, we'll get that letter out. Uh, I saw, uh, Ron Estes was at uh, the round table yesterday that we, we went to with uh, the undersecretary and I already gave him a heads up that there will probably be a letter coming, so uh, he's aware of it. And, Chairman, and on that issue, I'd like to potentially differentiate between our local VA and, and what's happening nationally. I think there's, there are differences. I mean, our, our, our VA here is not exactly like, they're not experiencing all of the same problems that they're seeing everywhere else across this country. I would like to be very careful not to overstate or, or whatever. I, again, I, I know there are issues that need to be addressed, but I don't want to. I don't want to. But the the issues we're having have to be solved at the national level. I agree, and so again, I, I just don't want to uh, criticize something that's happening here that actually may not be as bad here. You know, or we're doing some things that are right here. I like to recognize that, but, but there are to some extent. Some. But their communication here is very, very, very poor. And, and just and also on that, I had sent Rick Amen essentially the same letter about two months ago. Okay. So he, he is respond. he That's is a, he is aware of the issues. Okay. So we have been trying to work with the local VA and we have gotten no response. Okay, speaking of the VA, okay, uh, <clears throat> we have really a, a hero from Kansas here. Uh, and I don't know how many people know his name. His name is Lieutenant Bleckley. We have actually have a little street named after him. Uh, this uh, lieutenant, uh, during World War I, it's the 100th anniversary of uh, what he did, but during World War I, we had a lost battalion. Uh, and uh, he and his 
he was an observer pilot, as I recall, and, and his pilot uh, went to find him. Uh, they then started dropping some supplies because they were surrounded. Uh, and uh, when he came back, he said, we're going to go again, because uh, it says we'll either make the delivery or we'll die trying. And uh, unfortunately, they died trying. Uh, and so on Saturday, October 6th at the VA at 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock, uh, they're going to have recognition for Lieutenant Bleckley. Uh, a number of speakers are going to be there. They've got a full agenda. So uh, I think uh, it's very significant, uh, very good-looking young officer. Uh, it was an uh, Air Force officer, by the way. Army Air Corps. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have Air Force back then, but he is, he's a guy that was. <laughs> anyway, I thought if anyone would be, want to be interested in that, I think it's quite an opportunity. It's a Medal of Honor recipient, right? Say that again? Didn't you have a Medal of Honor for that? Yes. Yeah. Didn't he? Yeah. If I remember. And there will be Medal of Honor winners at the event that day. A number of general officers will be there. It's going to be a pretty nice celebration. Any other commissioners have anything? Is any of the elected? I lost all my elected. They don't. Hundred <laughs> percent of them abandoned. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone around the table have anything? See nothing. I guess we're adjourned. Thank y'all.